Hello, welcome everybody to the Search Mastery Speaker Series um, um, for our, our October version. We're, we're very excited to have Dan Russell um, back with us today. We were talking before, the, before we got together to say that this is his third annual appearance in the Search Mastery Speaker Series. So we're very um, grateful to, and, and um, happy to have Dan back. He's gonna talk about the search for knowledge, how technology changes literally everything you know and how you know everything. And I'll just give a brief um, a, a brief um, bio on Dan for people who, who um, haven't met him before. But Dan has been working in artificial intelligence and human computer interaction for nearly, nearly 40 years. He has, he's worked in um, several of the top technology invention companies in Silicon Valley, including Google, Apple, Xerox, and IBM, and has been at the forefront of many of their innovations. He teaches in the human AI group at Stanford's computer science department and is currently a visiting scholar at the uh, University of Zurich informatics department. And Dan's joining us today from, um, from Zurich. He was in the core search um, engineering team at Google for over 17 years, working on many aspects of providing understandable, reliable, coherent search results. He's written over 200 technical articles for professional journals as well as many articles for the popular press. And his most recent book, The Joy of Search, I have it here, in a Google Insider's Guide to Going Beyond the Basics is now out in paperback, so that's great. Um, he's taught over a thousand classes in person in venues ranging from fourth grade um, classes in rural America to professional classes for reference librarians at the Library of Congress. Uh, his online classes have been watched by millions of students for an accumulated watch time of 3.5 million hours of watch time. Um, and I also do want to want to um, mention Dan's blog, Search Research. It's great there, um, and I recommend that for people who are interested in um, keeping up on um, what's going on in search, how to think about search, and um, and all things um, current and future search. So. Having said all that, I will um, turn things over to Dan. Oh, and um, if you have questions, put them in the chat and I will monitor the chat if there are things that are um, you'd like to, you know, um, that it, and probably we'll save most of them for the end, but there, if there's anything that um, should be sort of um, brought up in the context of what you're talking about, Dan, I'll just um, raise it then. So I'll um, turn the screen over to you. Great. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me get started by uh, saying I am at the University of Zurich right now, having a marvelous time eating way too much cheese and chocolate. But I'm teaching this class on human computer interaction and AI. And this ultimately led to thinking about this topic about the search for knowledge, because I've been working on search and how to be a master of search. How, how do we get to be good at this? So. One of the things that has always occurred to me is I, I can teach you a bunch of stuff about search, but you know, search is more, or rather research is more than just a list of tricks. It's difficult to capture on a slide or two or a handout or a PDF file, what you need to know to be good at finding knowledge and finding information accurately. So I wanna start off with an example that I, I've given before, but I'm gonna give it a different twist this time. So this image you see here is from the island of Delos. And I went there a few years ago and uh, it looks like this when you're approaching it by boat. And the thing to note about this island- yeah, is Dan, it's can I, can, Dan, can I just um, say that we can't see you, your, your screen yet, your slides yet? You can't see my slides yet. Not yet. So, that's bad. Um, let's go back, I'm gonna get out. What can you see now? We, I'm just seeing you. You might just have to, there, yeah, now we, now we got it. Now you got it, okay, good, okay, yep. thank you. When you started sharing before your slides, it, it popped mine off, I guess. Um, so this is, this is Delos, that sort of, you see the amphitheater thing down there. And when you approach it uh, from the sea, you see that. So it's one giant archeological island and it's back in the middle of the Aegean Sea. As a side effect, everybody seemed to have gone through it or passed it or traded or bought something there. So it's deeply archaeological, deeply interesting. 
And it's a fascinating place because uh, there's a lot of ruins on the island, including this one, which is the pediment, the bottom of this big uh, temple to Apollo and Diana. So it's one of the major pieces of archaeology on the island. And when I was there, the thing that struck me was seeing this thing in the gold rec rectangle there. Um, it says Captain M.C. Perry, USN 1826. And I saw that and I thought, do they mean this guy? Uh, is this that M.C. Perry? So 1826 was the, the date on the graffiti. And I know about M.C. Perry, Matthew Perry, as the U.S. Commodore who opened Japan to trade with the West. I thought, Ooh, what are the odds? You know. So I thought, I'll find out. So I took that important step. I was curious about it and said, can I find out? Can I do the obvious Google search and find out was M.C. Perry in Greece in 1826? And you kind of get okay results. And if you horse around for long enough, you'll find not a lot. There's just not a lot of documentation. I can I know he was in the Mediterranean during that period, but I really want really clear justification to know that he was on that island in 1826. So eventually all my searching brought me to, to this um, search for the logbook of the USS North Carolina. It was easy to find that he was on that ship, the ship of the line, USS North Carolina. And so I discovered that here is a finding aid in Google Books that would allow me to actually figure out where the logbook is. I think this is awesome, but sorry, it's not in full view. So I click on that button that's in the oval down there on the left side, find in a library. Surprise, this book is in the library at Stanford, which is only two miles away from my house. Get on my bicycle, I ride over there, I look at the book and it tells me, yes, you can find this book, the log book, just not here but it told me where it was. That's what a finding aid does. The finding aid is basically indexed to something else. In this case, it took me to the Eleutherian Library in Wilmington, Delaware. So the next time I was in New York, I just took a train down to Wilmington and I was at the library, the, the archives, and they were very nice and they gave me actually access to the logbook. Yay, I look at it and you can see that this is the actual logbook and there in the red circle, is running alongside the south side of Delos on this date, 1826, USS North Carolina. Cool, I think I'm almost there, but I did he get off the boat? How would I figure that out? Hmm. So I found out through the finding aid that there are two other stacks that have copies of the logbook because back in the days before photocopying or before scanning and printing, some poor quartermaster, some poor midshipman actually had to physically make a second copy and a third copy. Go figure. But I went to those libraries and I looked and basically, yeah, there are real copies. And there's one more copy. I go to the Library of Congress Archives. And there I get, guess what? Another copy. So it's exactly the same. And I'm depressed at this point because I know that they're there, but I don't know anything else about whether they got off or whatever. So I've, I'm kind of sunk. And as I'm sitting there at my carol, one of the archivists walks by and says, hey, did you think about the letters? What do you mean letters? They're not in any index anywhere. He says, well, trust me, ships of that time would always, people on board would write letters and send them home and they're here in the archive. Just request them. Here's how you fill out the form. How was I supposed to know that? This is an interesting theme that's going to keep coming up and up again. In this case, he told me about these letters and I requested the letter. And I took the trouble. I took probably an hour sitting there in the Library of Congress archives to learn how to read 19th century penmanship. I can actually read that. I don't want you to bother, so I'm going to just transcribe it for you. I found a letter from the captain to his wife, Minerva, in Washington, D.C., which says, of all the professions I suppose you would think me the least qualified for, that of an antiquitarian, blah, 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 blah. And in red, I have at this time on board the North Carolina as many relics of one kind or another as would load 10 wagons, and among them number two white marble altars from the temples of Apollo and Diana and Delos. 
Dang, got it. Smoking gun. Okay, now why am I telling you this story? It's not just to prove that I can, uh, I can do a really great search thing, but I will tell you, there's a, an assumption on the part of a lot of young searchers in particular, that everything is online. You and I know, we are part of the in-group about these things. We know not everything's online, and this is a category of things that's really not online. In fact, the index points don't even exist for those letters. So they're really totally offline. You have to talk to the archivist. But here's what happened. This is kind of a step-by-step -step summary of the steps I went through. I asked the basic question. So I had that curiosity moment. I did a search, went to Google Books, went to Stanford Library, ar archive number one, archive number two, archive number three. I put in a lot of miles to do this project. But the crucial step there was the archivist suggesting the letters. And I then did all that, fine. The interesting point for young searchers is that only this part is online. Only this part. Most of this was me flipping through old pages of manuscripts. The other thing to remember here is that these two steps, me asking the basic question, and then me spending time to learn 19th century handwriting, and in some ways, the whole process, persisting, being curious, and being having enough curiosity to continue to do the search, is a metacognitive move. This is a key point I want to make today. There are tactics you can have. You know how to make the, the, the search engine sing and dance. You need to have strategic information at your fingertips so you know what kind of resources to look for. And you need to have the metacognitive skills to change the way of thinking. For example, exerting executive control so that this long delayed gratification of me finding that letter is something that could be done. So this is the point. Here's what happens in reality. This is what most people do. Most people don't get beyond the first page. And if you look at that curve, that click-through curve, most people don't get beyond the first result. Okay? Now, there are things happening that will change this behavior in interesting ways. But the reality is this is the graph of, say, several million people clicking through on links on, on Google. Most people then read the snippet or the summary of the abstract of the page that this is being described, and that's it. They don't even click through. This is no way to run a research ship. So my deeper point is there are multiple aspects here. There's the metacognitive aspects, what you need to know about yourself and the way you think. There's the strategic knowledge and skills and the tactical knowledge and skills in order to get all of this to work together. If you want to be a good researcher, you need to have these three weapons in your armamentarium. Let me tell you another story. So that's the Delo story. And I think it, it illustrates the sort of the combination of the tactical, the strategic, and the metacognitive. But I want to tell you another story that does sort of the same thing, but then leads us into an interesting discussion about tactics. So this happened to me the other day. Um, in fact, <laughs> it happened to me last week. I was looking for a quote to use in this lecture. And I remembered that it was something that Conrad Gessner, this famous scientist from the 16th century, once wrote about being too many books and it was just kind of a pain. And I remember that it was um, in Anne Blair's book. And I vaguely have that memory. So the question is, can I find it? Now, I think of myself as a good searcher. So I think, hey, how hard is this? Well. There's a couple of things to realize about your metacognition. Roughly speaking, a metacognitive skill is your ability to change the way you behave because you reflect on your own mental processes. That's the meta part. For instance, if I can't find something, one of my first questions should be to question my own memory. So I'm searching here initially for a book of quote about too many books to read, something about information overload. I, my memory is it is by Conrad, Conrad Gessner. Everything fails. I spend probably a couple hours, I can't figure it out. Metacognitive move. Maybe it wasn't Conrad Gessner. That's the first kind of question, the metacognitive question you have to ask yourself. So I have to come up with an alternative, alternative search strategy. So I have to switch into a strategic thinking mode. 
So, okay, let's try to figure out what the source document is. I remember it's by this, maybe in this book by, by Ann Harris. Now, I thought it was too big to know, but then I searched for that by Ann Harris and it's, it doesn't work. So metacognition, maybe it's not too big to know. Maybe it's, I've misremembered the author, misremembered the book, misremembered the quote. Okay, what are the standard ways in which a memory fails like that? You do synonym substitution or you choose another near name rather than the correct name. So in fact, it wasn't Anne Harris. And the title of the book is not too big to know, but the title is too much to know. And once I know that, I discover it's by Anne Blair. Okay, fine. So now I just do the standard search and I find a full text of the book. I find a PDF somewhere and I search in that book and I cannot find Gessner. What? I look through this thing and I finally figure out it's Gessner with two S's. Ah, hey, you see what happened? My tactical search that is control Fing inside of the book was not working out because I was misspelling the name. Okay, you see where this is going? Um, I'm now searching for this quote because I can't find his name. So I search for a multitude of books and sure enough, I find it. But it's not by Gessner at all. It's by this other guy, Francisco Arroz. Arroz. So what happened? My memory was faulty. My searches were inadequate. I had to re-strategize and rethink my own cognition. I had to think that maybe I should do a synonym shift somehow, find a new author, find a new top book title. And I was boiled down to me searching for a single word inside the full text of that book. And I discovered it. So I was still stuck. Why couldn't I find Gessner? Why can't I find this name? So I will show this. This is actually a, a, an image from the book. And you can see it, the quote is, in our time, the multitude of books becomes an immensity. So that it's more effort to find and distinguish the books than it is to obtain and read the letters. Blah, 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 blah. This is by Francisco Araos, 1627. I'm oh, sorry, 1631. So you see the problem. Information overload and search has been a problem <laughs> for a long time, right? But well, I thought it was Gessner. And the reason is, my reverse engineering my metacognition, is that Gessner is mentioned elsewhere in the book. So why couldn't I find him? Ah, so I went and looked in the German Wikipedia, right? Because he's a German, he's a Swiss person. Very famous scientist, very famous plant scientist, very famous physician, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and there are like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different spellings of his name. So why didn't find work in that document? Because I was misspelling his name. And find is nothing if not picky. So here's the thing I want you to think about. How much knowledge do you need to know about the mechanisms that you're using in the tools of search. And I'm gonna say it's a fair bit. My example here is I did a Google book search for the name Conrad Gessner. Now notice how it's spelled there and the blue text there, it's G-E-S-N-E-R. And when you look at the book that I found here on the right, you can see the Conrad is highlighted, but Gessner, that is the text next to that name on the right, is not there, it's not highlighted. Why? Google is fixing up my spelling. It found the appropriate, it found a book by him and then led me to the book. And how can I now search for that name given that it's a, that's the long S version of the name? Okay, so I got a book. It looks like this. Uh, I can read some German, but that font is really weird. So what am I gonna do? Here's a strategy or rather a tactic for you. So I found this image in a Google book. I just copy paste it, copy, uh, select it, snip it out, save it as a JPEG file. And then once I have that, I can open it in my browser, which I've done here on the left, and then right click on the image and say, search for that text using Google Lens. Now I know, and you should know that Google Lens when it sees a block of text like that, we'll say, hey, do you want me to convert it to text for you? Because remember, this is a JPEG on the left. 
do you want me to convert it to text? And oh, I see it's in German. You want me to translate that for you? I say, sure. So it translates the text in place. So you see what I've done. I've take, gone from the text image to the actual text in translation. And now I can read this whole thing. I can copy paste that. Fantastic. So what I did here is I copy pasted that block of text into a regular text editor. And I want to point out a couple of things here. First off, uh, there are a lot of underlined, red underlined, misspelled words, quote, misspelled words. It's just that the dictionary doesn't include Crato or Gessner or Cordes, or any of these people. So they're just highlighting names. But this is just a regular old text editor, just like Microsoft Word. Now, when I search for Gessner, I get zero hits. Uh, what's going on here? So let me try this again. I'm going to copy paste this into Google Docs. Notice that there are no misspelled words here because it recognizes all of the names. This is one of the advantages of working on a, on a platform that has a ton of background data. It says, oh, guess near, oh, Cordis, oh, Crato, I, those are real names. They're not misspellings. That's why those are not highlighted under with red underlines. So I can search for Gessner now, and I do G-E-S-S-N-E-R, and look what it does. See that highlight at the very top? See that one right there? G-E-S-S, that's a big S, big S, and E-R. That's the German character for double S. So what is happening is that this is a smart command F, control F. It's searching for this name, Gessner, and recognizing that, that that character represents double S. You have to understand how your tools work. Otherwise, you can't do the work yourself. So I'm in Zurich right now. And one of the things we know is that Zurich comes with an umlaut, or sometimes it comes without an umlaut. What's your text editor going to do? How are you going to find, how are you going to search for these things? And I'm drawing a distinction between find in text, in a block of text, like on a document, versus search. Because we'll get to the distinction, what search does in a second. But find on page is often very sensitive. It doesn't do expansion of variance. It doesn't do spell correction, unless you're connected to an online service like, you know, uh, uh, Google Docs or something like that. So the question for you as a search master is to be thinking about what does your favorite retrieval discovery system do? For example, if you go to your OPAC in your favorite library and you search for Zurich with the umlaut, will you get different results than without the umlaut? How about Gessner with two S's? Will you also find results that have the big S version or not? These are the things we need to understand. So I went and grabbed the Wikipedia page on, about Zurich, copy pasted it into Acrobat. So this on the left is an Acrobat version of the Wikipedia page about Zurich. This is the English language Wikipedia page. And if you do a search or rather a, a find, you'll see there are 445 instances of the term Zurich here. Okay, what's it doing? It's recognizing through the umlaut. It's recognizing the umlaut as a legitimate version of the spelling of Zurich. This is, uh, this is a favorite text editor again. And I looked for Zurich and you can see there's one hit. All those other Zurichs that have the umlaut, forget about it, doesn't recognize it, doesn't want to, doesn't give you the option. So if I go to my Chrome browser and type Zurich, Without the umlaut, it will recognize, it will see through the umlaut and recognize that that's the same, same word. And it conveniently gives me all the hits. That's what all these things are on the right-hand side. All, the, all those dashes are instances where it hits in the, in the document. So one of the things to recognize is that find or search with diacritical characters or special spellings or whatever can be sensitive. If you search for the word Morton, M-O-R-T-E-N, in Google, rich, regular Google, you'll get a whole bunch of videos because he's a famous DJ and he does, he does live sets. Fine. But suppose you want to, with a slash O, the Danish spelling of that name. Well, you're not getting it. And the reason is that 
these other non slash O characters dominate the slash O results. So there's 20 million results with the slash O. On the other hand, if you double quote, you can actually find instances with the slash O and you only get 92. And that's just, it's, you can see why the non slash O character comes way to the top. So what I'm, what I'm trying to get you to understand is that there are capabilities that you may not know about. Things you can do with control F that you didn't know were possible. My favorite example was I went to this restaurant the other day here in, in Zurich. And I thought, you know, I don't know what those things are. I really want control F in the translated version of that. And I just showed you how to do it, right? What I did is I took a photograph of that in Google Lens and said, show me the text and please translate it for me. And there you go. That's the translated thing. I can now control F inside of that text. See what I've done is I've taken something from image space into a searchable space. This is one of the ways you can grab knowledge out of the world. Key point, this is all classic AI, classic image recognition, classic processing, classic language translation AI capabilities. We've got all these things for search, for learning. This is one of the ways that we can be empowered to learn. Now, don't use it for mushrooms. You probably remember about the app that will do mushroom recognition identification. Don't trust it. Doesn't matter how good your AI is. If it makes one error in a, in a thousand, it's gonna be you that <laughs> makes the mistake. So as, as Mary Frances mentioned, uh, I did write this book and it has come out paperback and it's got a lot of these lessons in it. And a big piece of the, of the lessons of the book and what I'm trying to, to tell you about today is that there are really three different kinds of, of knowledge that we need to know as search masters. First off is the tactical. That's the stuff that takes you, that's the sort of the syntactic things, the tricks, the special operators, all that stuff. How to put together a good query in order to make the search engine work. Second major category is strategic knowledge. And for example, what are different resources you can use to search for the thing you're looking for? How do you triangulate between different resources to assess credibility? And thirdly, how to intelligently read a resource? Because as you know, I teach a lot of classes. So I look over a lot of students' shoulders and I see that they're skipping through whatever it is they found and they misread the results of the search. The search gave them what they needed. And if they misread it, you know, so be careful. And the third big category is this metacognitive knowledge. We need to understand our own error patterns, our own ways of acting in the world that block us or help us or cause us mistakes. So simple one, executive control is a big part of metacognition. How long are you going to search for something before you give up? How, how much time will you devote to going down a rat hole? Are you aware of the amount of time you're spending doing that? And that metacognitive behavior tells you when to stop and when to shift strategies. There's a lot about this. So what, one sort of strategic error, I'm going to give you a bunch of examples now. Um, one strategic error is that people don't think through a question. They just will blithely type, what's the distance to the moon? And they get an answer. People will often look at the answer and be done. Just happens all the time even though they haven't thought about it. So if you think a little bit more carefully, because for example, you look at the result number two, result number two says the moons are over around the earth is elliptical. At perigee, it's close to the approach. It's close as 225,000 miles. At apogee, it's 252,000 miles. The strategic question you should be asking yourself at this point is does that matter? If all I'm trying to do is get a you know, ballpark figure, then that's fine. But if you're actually trying to fly something and land it on the moon, you need to know it down to the centimeter, not plus or minus 10% of the total orbit. Another kind of error is blithely accepting your first result as correct or accurate, even though it may be that your query is very sensitive to nuances of your query terms. So this is the same query with two different words substituted 
as the adjective, the longest dinosaur or the biggest dinosaur? Radically different answers. Those are different beasts. They're both big, but they're really different. But I see people making that kind of strategic error, just saying the first query, it must be right, done all the time. Or not understanding the question being asked in its entailment. And, and so reference librarians see this kind of thing all the time. Why was the Civil War fought? How long have you got, my friend? How heavy is the Grand Canyon? I don't know what to say. Uh, who won the War of 1812? The answer there depends on who's asking. If you're in the UK and ask that question, you get a different answer than if you ask it in Maryland, right? Or I can't find the classic novel, War and Peaches. What's that book around about anyway? Uh, you know, this is one of those things that great reference librarians know how to handle. So this is a kind of strategic knowledge that's important to understand. So we've got this interesting interplay between the basic research skills and metacognitive knowledge. So a big part of this basic knowledge of being a search master is knowing what it's possible to ask, that is understanding the capability space of your system. And I don't mean necessarily just Google, but all, everything else, how Bing, how Edge works, how large language models work, understanding what the space of possibilities are and knowing how to be metacognitive about your own metacognition, if that's not too meta, recursive, redundant. So let's talk about what kinds of things you can ask because that's base. You will not ask Google or any search engine a question if you don't think it, it's gonna work. That's a, that's a sort of barrier to entry. So could you ask this question? And I don't mean searching for that image. I mean, actually interpreting the Maya code. Um, up until say a couple, like last year, this was an impossibility. You would just say, uh, good luck. There was no representation. But now it turns out Unicode actually has a proposal for all the Mayan glyphs in Unicode. I want this to expand your range of thinking because all of a sudden, I predict we're gonna to start to see Mayan codices coming online, and then it's going to change the nature of Mayan scholarship. That's exciting. What about this? This is in Deve Devehi script. And if you don't know it, it's a script used in the Maldive Islands. And if I ask a question like a book about love, I get some results. So there's a capability there you may or may not understand. But multilingual stuff is just part and parcel of an international world. And of course, the capability space of Google search is you can ask, you know, interesting esoteric programming questions like this. What is this? Why does that evaluate to that? What does this code expression do? Et cetera, et cetera. A couple of years ago, you couldn't do this. You would not, this would not result in a legal question, legal query telling you this because the capability space changes all the time. And as you know, with Chad GPT and BARD and Perplexity and all these new online AI systems, it's changing yet again. Stay on top. So we all have this implicit mental model of how search engines work. And that's sort of key to, to understanding what kinds of things we can do. So one thing you can do here is uh, ask a question like this. Here's a, a sophisticated query. Find me Angela Davis near Gavin Newsom in some web page. And you can end up on a web page like this. It's a long web page. And now as I do control F for Davis, I don't find it. <clears throat> Google, you lied to me. Why did you lie to me? Well, it didn't lie to you. It's just that the people who made this web page hid some text. And so you actually have to click on more in order to open divs, these closed or hidden divs, which are these special blocks on the web page. So when you do control F, it doesn't search inside hidden divs. You actually have to show it in order for that to work. Another piece of technology reaching up and having impact on our ability to find or search. So as we mentioned, right, be careful about diacriticals. Uh, use the most common language spelling for you, whatever you know, culture you're in. Um, try to do things if you're doing, for example, control F, search for the shortest unique substring. So for example, uh, Jasekovich down there, 
I'm never going to spell that right twice. So I would look, I would control F for J A S K in a document. You can't do that for a Google search, though. Right. So you, if you're going to do a Google search, you have to have the whole token because Google does not do partial, partial term completion. You have to understand that's a very technical way of saying you can't get partial word searches to work. Other database systems, there are lots of library systems that have partial term completion. Use that to your advantage. So you might use Google, for example, to locate a particular database that might have something in it. And then, then you can use the stemming and completion pattern searching within that to find stuff that you cannot find with Google. You need to know the trade-offs. And if you have, for example, um, this is my Kindle and I was reading uh, Alice in Wonderland. And I thought, oh, I want to see Jabberwocky, the poem, Twas Brilli, Slightly Toes, and so on. Um, and I did this, I did a find for Jabberwocky within the book, and it said there are no results. Ah, recognition of self. It's not in this book, it's in the other book, right? So this is the Conrad Gessner case all over again. I had a misremembrance, an incorrect memory of where the poem was. And this allowed me to, to prove the negative, prove it's not in this one. So, I'm going to give you another example here of um, uh, strategy and tactics interacting in interesting way. So suppose I want to find the full view of Audubon's Books of America, Birds of America. Looks like that. Go to Google Books, do the obvious thing. You want to find full view, so I select that. And you can do this and step through all these different search process steps. And you're looking for, say, volume five. I want to find where the, my book, my bird is in that book. And I can't find it. So maybe I have to go search other editions to make sure I get all of the things that are scanned in Google, Bird, uh, Google Books. I click through this. I click through that. I can find everything except volume five. Little flag should go off in your head to say, hey, it's time for a strategy shift because I can't find it here. So what do you do? Well, in this case, I know enough to know about the Internet Archive. And the Internet Archive has a bunch of stuff, including volume five of Audubon, that is not available through Google Books. So you have to remember there's things like the Hathi Trust, there's the Internet Archive, there's a bunch of other repositories of scanned books. So when you're failing in one particular strategy, don't give up. Realize that you have to lift up and see what else can I do here. Do not forget that there's also a lot of knowledge in videos. And as you probably know, videos are really great for some things and terrible for other things. One of the things that you can now do is that Google has been running transcriptions on all the videos, so the text is now searchable. So if I do a query like this, how to extract DNA from strawberries, oh, it turns out that there are some videos that have exactly that procedure. So here it is. And if you want to get to the point, so this is a nine minute video. I don't want to sit around for nine minutes. Who's got that kind of time, right? I want to just jump to that point where they're doing the extraction. So this is a little bit of a hidden trick. It's not the best UI in the world. If you click on the three dots, lower right corner, it's where the big arrow is, it will open up the transcript. And then on the right hand side, you can see the entire transcript with timestamps. Control F in the transcript to find, say, lysis. And if you click on that point right there, it will jump to that point in the video. It saves a huge amount of time. Big trick I use a lot, copy and copy out the entire text of the transcript. And then I can use that as an index or as a note to myself. So it opens up this interesting question. What can you search for? What can you do? How do you find the appropriate sources? So another example. Walking down the street, Southern California, I see this, this tree. And I'm a bit of an amateur botanist. I think, oh, that's interesting. I want to see what kind of tree that is. So I use my Google Lens thing and point it there and say, OK, tell me what that is. And it says, oh, it's a big ficus tree. Well, yeah, duh. It's a big ficus tree. I knew that. What kind of ficus tree Right, is the question. And you kind of horse around for a little bit. And it says it's ficus retusa. 
Well, I know enough about ficus trees that though that is not a retusa. That's a macrocarpa. But I had to go to iNaturalist to figure that out. So my point is not to diss Google Lens. This is a genuinely hard problem. There are a lot of genuinely hard problems. Mushrooms are hard. Ficus trees are hard. Lots of little red flowers are hard. Little brown birds are hard. So you have to recognize this. You have to understand the capabilities of your systems. So in this case, there are more than 120 subspecies of ficus. They're hard for people to tell apart. And I can poke around and look at this flowers and everything. So I want you to consider what your mental model is of the search engines or the search tools that you're using. When is it correct? When should you question it? How do we think about critical thinking? So here's an example of a query done to Google. And the query is sine x squared times cosine y. And it does this really beautiful thing. Uh, I, it's probably not running at full frame rate on, over Zoom, but it actually is rotating beautifully. Uh, and it gives me all this information. Now, as a skilled searcher, I need to know that there are interesting other new kinds of information. That's You can see that right there in the middle, it says Mathway and Symbol Lab. Yeah, those are ways to get more tutoring on this kind of trig function. They weren't there not long ago. And of course, Microsoft has not been sitting on their heels. Bing on Edge, on the Edge browser, gives me this nice set of results with a sort of function derivation on the right. And if you do Bing, on Chrome, you get a different one. Where I'm headed with this is there are now multiple different sources of information. There are multiple ways to search and they give you different results. I mean, it's not saying black is white and red is green, but it's giving you different perspectives on this same kind of information. This perspective taking thing is a great strategic move to make. Of course, if you go to Wolfram Alpha, you get yet another one. And of course, YouTube's got videos with all of this that show you how to do the derivation or how to do the analysis of that function. So all these systems are making recommendations about different kinds of ways of looking at our content. Here's a study done by Carrie Kai, my colleague at Google and a bunch of her, her friends um, in the Google Brain. And what they've been working on is how to get expert systems to recognize cancers, in this case, in slides of, of potentially cancerous tissue. And so they do this image query, they just like a Google lens, and they say, we built a special system to find cancers in tissue. And the question is, is this non-cancer or is it cancer A or cancer B? And so they go through this fancy AI, I think, to figure it out. And what people want, that is what physicians want, is a couple of things. They want confidence that this thing is correct. And what they have found in this research is what you wanna do is give people multiple options and controls over the recommendations so that they can look, they, the physicians, can look at the different recommendations and see which one is actually the thing that they want. Now, this sounds obscure, but this is exactly the same as a regular search problem. And what you're seeing here is the ability to refine based on different criteria. So that slider you see at the top there is allowing you to shift what you're seeing as most similar. Now, if you're involved in libraries at all, this should look really familiar to you because it's exactly the same as asking for recommendations for books. It looks more medical, but it's the same idea. In this case, um, I asked, uh, uh, this is Bing, and I asked Bing, um, I'm in the sixth grade looking for a book recommendation for a book about the Civil War. Remember this crazy question about the Civil War? This is an interesting way to think about it. So here you get a couple of nice recommendations. Of course, if I go to Bard, I get a, a slightly different set of recommendations. and if you give a different prompt, in this case, a veteran who lived through the Second World War, I'm looking for a book about the Civil War, what would you recommend? You get these three recommendations from a Bard, you get these three from ChatGPT4, and you get these 
from Bing Edge, which is using chat G3P something, right? The deep point here is that none of these are wrong. They're all sort of decent, but they're slightly different perspectives. And the prompts that you give are basically torquing the kind of space of results you're going to see. Go back to the, to the math question. Realize that with Google Lens, you can actually take a photograph of a handwritten expression like this one, x squared minus three x plus two, and ask it to solve it for you. So that's what you're seeing here. It's presenting the options to solve it using a quadratic formula or to factor it. And if you click, you know, do that, solve it with a quad, quad, quadratic formula, it will give you a very nice presentation. Did you know that? Deep point to take away is strategic and tactical knowledge change very, very quickly in the face of kind of unrelenting innovation. So you're seeing Microsoft and Google going back and forth. And it, I have to say, you need to stay on top of this stuff. But uh, if you've read any of my reading, writings or any of other people's writings, um, the cautionary note with a lot of these large language models is that they've been trained on what they've been trained on. And they will do what they've been trained to do. And so here is a very simple math on the top. There's multiply nine slash five by and add 32. Get correct, perfect answer. But if you change the numbers just slightly, it takes it out of its realm of training knowledge. And all of a sudden the answers get wrong. If you didn't check, you might write down four or five, seven dot six in your test book, wouldn't you? And so you have to be able to validate these things. So, this ability to, to recognize what resources are there and have strategic understanding um, is really important, not just in the large language model uh, math thing, but also for understanding that there are different perspectives on the world. So this big question I asked at the beginning, how do you know? One way to know is through Wikipedia. And it has its advantages and disadvantages. We can talk about that, but I wanna point out that there are multiple Wikipedias and they are not all the same. So we've got, for example, the Italian Wikipedia, which I've just taken the outline of the article here and translated it to English. And we've got the English article on Leonardo da Vinci. Notice anything different between the Italian and the English version? Here's something to notice. The English article, the entire English Wikipedia entry has 8,000 words in it. The Italian Wikipedia article is 23,000 words in it. That's a big difference. There are topics in the Italian article by Leonardo that are not in the English one at all. They really, really care about the Italian version. And so you get a different perspective. This is also true if you look at the English version of uh, uh, Russian, uh, Russian mafia groups. The Russian language Wikipedia is very different than the English language version. And if you ask, for example, something simple, like how, what are the most common cat diseases? Here's, here's the result from Google. If you ask in Spanish, you get a different set. If you ask in German, you get a different set yet again. Deep point, cultural perspectives are really important with respect to knowledge access. So if you look at those three different language groups, you'll see that the English kind of focuses on feline rabies and feline leukemia and so on. Feline leukemia is shared between English and Spanish, but almost nothing in the German category makes it into either English or Spanish. Why? I don't really know, but it's a fascinating distinction that these different Wikipedia entries give. So it's important to understand the boundary conditions of what works and what doesn't work here. We don't want to be like these people who followed the Google Maps and turned onto a muddy road and got stuck. You also have to be re reasonable about it. So we have to think about what our metacognitive skills are. I'm going to tell you, being curious about these things is really important. Being willing to go one more and understanding what works for your executive behaviors. So one important metacognitive skill is the willingness to learn and to learn by reading. And there's a different kind of reading for online resources and online interfaces. So here, for example, I'm gonna flash through 
uh, several images of Google Maps. This is from 2006. I just want you to look at the different options available and the different controlling widgets. Look at the links on the right-hand side, looks at the scaler to control the zoom on the left. Ah, uh, a year later, the links are on the left and the, the, the controller is here, sort of there. They have different, slightly different results. The rendering is different. A year later, all of a sudden, the links now have pictures associated with them. Controls are slightly different. Oh, now it's called something different. New product name. Everything's slightly shifted around. A year later, same thing. You see where this is going? Products evolve, and they evolve often rapidly. So that was five years from 2005 to 2010. And then in 2011, we had this version of Maps. And there were two interaction widgets on there that absolutely nobody read. By read, I mean looked at and then used. So they're very, very tiny interaction widgets to slide the, the panel to the left or to open it out to another window. Nobody clicked on them, so we got rid of them. And this, of course, is what Google Maps looks like today. If you go from five years ago to today, it's a huge shift. I assume you're looking at this thing almost daily and understanding what's working, what's not working. So we need to understand as users what skill set we need in order to be able to use our tools effectively. So let me finish up with a, a real quick thought about large language models, ChatGPT and BARD and so on. Um, uh, you have to recognize them for what they are. They're basically cybernetic mansplainers. They're trained on text data and they synthesize what sounds good, but they don't really understand what it is they're saying. So if you ask for something very specific, Here's an ex example from Google asking about uh, Google Search Console. Everything in red is wrong or misleading. So again, validate everything. However, these large language models can be really handy if you're asking questions about text. So I had this question about what's mumble core, synth core, electronic core, and cottage core. And if I asked ChatGPT, it gave me this very nice analysis. But it, look what it's doing. It's looking at the text as a, a topic. It's I'm not asking it about the Google Search Console. I'm not asking it about a thing in the world. I'm asking about a property of language. Did a great job. And you can use these kinds of questions to expand your search range. So another great way to use a large language model is to ask for examples of core, of this dash core is a suffix, or to ask questions to expand the range of subtopics you might be investigating. For example, uh, what are sub five common subtopics? And here are some really nice examples. Now you should use these as hints on how to go do your regular search. So here's three slides of advice. You can use it, language models to identify gaps in information spaces, ask for topics, give lots of context when you're giving your prompt, which is the opposite of what I said about giving Google queries. Add more text, ask for multiple options, and iterate on the output. And one really great trick here is to consider when you're trying to do ideation, use one or two word prompts for maximum openness. Go ahead and, and put those into BARD or chat GPT and see what you get. It's fascinating. Of course, bottom line, validate all your work and do not trust them. Now, I, could, I couldn't help but sort of end with, with a, a return to the island of Delos. And so I asked Bard, did Commodore Perry ever visit the island of Delos? Now, I know I told you not to do this, but I did it for fun. And of course, the answer is, oh, no, uh, Delos is, is there, but he may have visited, but he was never there. So the bottom line is Commodore Perry never visited the island of Delos. So I asked OpenAI ChatGPT, and it said, well, Matthew Perry, the American actor, visited the Delos Island, but, you know, whatever. So I asked about Commodore Matthew Perry to discriminate between the actor and the Commodore. And it sort of said, well, maybe. So I asked Perplexity, another large language model. Did he ever visit? And look what the answer is. See that? The Greek island is birthing graffiti. There's only one relevant search result that mentions Perry at the island of Delos, and it's, yes. It's the Future of Information Alliance repost of my blog post about this very topic. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, but it also says at the bottom there, there was not, uh, the article does not provide further information about the visit. And I respectfully disagree. 
that blog post is fairly long and goes on and on in great detail about it. So here's the bottom line. The way we're asking these questions is always changing. Question asking has always been a skill. Now it's even more of a critical skill. People who know how to make AI systems work, if they can make, if you can make it sing and dance, you are going to have a distinct advantage. So for us as search mastery students, we have all these things, but we need to still have great strategic, tactical, and metacognitive skills to do this research. Most importantly, you have to have this attitude of, of curiosity. And you can't look up everything. So how do you do triage? That's a metacognitive skill. It's an executive function. Think of this whole separate topic here about how do you believe something and why do you believe that? So I'm going to remix Alvin Toffler's future shot just slightly and say, tomorrow's illiterate are those who cannot read, but those who cannot relearn, unlearn, and relearn. So I do, as Mary Frances suggests at the very beginning, I have got this blog and you can find out remarkable things. Like we know that's called the charm of hummingbirds. And so I was curious, how did you, how do you know that? Well, the common answer and what you usually get pointed to is the book of St. Albans from 1486. But if you actually spend the minute to read the book, you'll discover charm of hummingbirds is not in that book. And if you do it at Google Ngrams, you'll find Charm of Hummingbirds basically became popular in the 1980s, 1980s, right? Because there was a book that said it was hummingbirds, not finches. So I'm going to leave you with this thought. These things are constantly changing. We need to stay on top of it. And this is our goal, learning how to search effectively and precisely and deeply. There's all my contact information. And I almost used up the entire hour but I'll stop there and answer any questions you might have. I wish we had another half hour to, to hear more about what you have to say on these topics. This was really, really, really fantastic talk, Dan. Thank you very much. We have time for a question or two. If anybody wants to put something um, in the chat. I'll just give you a minute to to type, I'm, Dan, I'm going to use this recording for my open source intelligence class because it's a perspective on thinking about multiple sources of content and um, how to really assess your own um, your own thinking about a particular topic and how you're framing it and how you're limiting yourself by what you're you know what you're um, what you're asking about and, and what you're actually searching for. Well, um, feel free. I mean, you've got, um, I assume you'll put it up on the playlist for the search mastery, right? I will. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have it. We'll have it. Uh, we've got, we've got a lot of thank yous from, um, from different people and I'm, I'm afraid it's, um, it's noontime. So I, I just oh, want no. to thank, <laughs> I think that, I think we get, I think Rachel will cut us off. So um, I want to, I, I want to thank you um again for for being here for this great yeah. uh, for this great talk and just so everybody knows we will have the um we will have the talk up on um uh, probably takes it takes a few days i'll i'll send a note out to um to the attendees that the that, that um that it's been posted and then the communications people also publicize it um and we have we have i think we're going to have another talk in November, I've been trying to work with the people. Dan, you know, um, you.com is another another AI-assisted um, search engine that has some interesting features. And I've been trying to get there. We've been talking to their chief technology officer to see if we can't get um, somebody from there to talk to us. And then, yeah, we're, we're trying. So that would be fun. Um, and other than that, uh, so, so that we'll have an announcement on that. and. Um, then I'll just say thank you once more to Dan, and we really, really appreciate your being with us, giving us your sure. perspective. Uh, and I'll say to anybody who wants to drop me a particular note, uh, just do the obvious Google search for my email address. And if you can't find it, you need to take this class. <laughs> Very good. Good job. <laughs> All right. And if, if you, uh, my, my email um, information is here. If anybody needs Dan's address, I, email address, I have it too. All right. So. All right. Very good. Okay. Thank All right. You, thank everyone. you, Dan.